Okay, everyone, we'll get going. Um, you're very welcome. We're here for week one of our, the Art of the Mating. So we are, we're doing it via webinar. The webinar is structured as such. So we have our two esteemed panelists. We have Alan Porter, Alan, an advisor to over 350 stakes winners worldwide. Um, we have Fiona Craig, advisor to Moigler Stud, uh, breeders of countless champions and grade one winners, and one of the great owners and bre owner breeders um, in the game. Um, it's a webinar, so we have currently online, we have 136 people, which is wonderful. We had over 250 submissions of homework. Um, this will be recorded and we'll send it out to everyone that submitted homework after this. Um, and we had over 600 people sign up for um, the four-week course that we're going to run. Try, just getting experts to talk about matings, because it's a fascinating world and it's a world not a lot of people know about. Um, and we're going to hope over the next four weeks, take different segments. So this week is about the owner breeder. The, uh, next week is going to be about commercial breeding. Um, we're going to have a week with um, the stallion farms. And then we're going to talk about national hunt breeding as well. So four different weeks um, and four very different sectors. And we hope we, you get something out of it during that journey. But it's, this is just a distraction. It's a bit of fun. And hopefully we learn something along the way. Um, if you want to ask any questions, please do. You'll see at the bottom of, uh, um, of the screen, um, there's a Q&A function. You can uh, submit your questions on that. Um, I will then review those questions and I'll put them to um, our panelists as we go along. We'll also do some polling. So there'll be live polls as to what matings we decide to take um, later on as we progress through our three horses. So you would have received um, your briefing. Your briefing was uh, a quite fun one. You, you, Mr. Mark Multitech, and uh, a billionaire, he had a, a massive fortune and now he wants to turn a large fortune into a small fortune by investing in thoroughbreds <laughs> and buying some very exciting uh, mares that we've picked out. So we've picked out three of the top race fillies of the world and we're going to, um, each of us, take you through each of them, look at their pedigree, analyze it. We've got some wonderful homework that's been submitted already. We're going to talk about what people have, have been identifying in that. Um, and then we'll see how we go. So that's it. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Fiona and Alan for being here with us today. Um, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have such expertise uh, to helping everyone. And uh, our first mayor is the queen of the turf, Enable. So Enable, there she is winning the King George in an absolutely amazing race. And uh, She's a really, really fascinating pedigree, uh, Fiona. What, what, what would stand out straight away? When you look at a pedigree page like that, what, 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 what do you think straight away? Well, I think straight away, it's a pedigree that's been in, it, it's generations of a pedigree have been nurtured by the same um, nursery, which is a great advantage when doing matings. You know, they've bred, they've pretty much bred everything on that page, which does give them, they know the most about it, you know? Um, Nathaniel was a very good racehorse, again, out of another magnificent mare in magnificent style. You've just got, the, the pedigree tells you, Enable is what her pedigree says she should have been. And if you read the pedigree, it tells you that. 10 to 12 furlongs, getting better with age. Obviously, she's much the best there. Flincher was a very good horse, but she is, she, she, she exceeds anything else on the page. And Alan, when you have a look at that, I know straight away, what would jump out in the kind of family uh, the makeup the of that pedigree? The first thing looking at the pedigree pattern is that unusual now for a top class horse. She's inbred very, very closely to saddle as well, three by two. Um, back in the, say, the era of the 30s to the 50s, you'd see that kind of pedigree with Marcel Boussin. Uh, these days, you don't see top breeders experiment with inbreeding that closely very often um so she's unusual in that respect to be that closely inbred um and come from a top class farm uh on this on top of that what's also interesting is that and perhaps this is why the close inbreeding works there is that the rest of the pedigree nathaniel's dam and concentric's dam are, are very much an outcross and so perhaps that was something that allowed the saddlers, close saddlers as well as inbreeding to work. Um, you know, in terms of the aptitude and, and, and as Fiona said about the family, then yeah, th I'd agree with those points. But, but that's an interesting thing. We, we have found that there are measurable metrics for inbreeding that the, um, 
there's a coefficient of inbreeding. There's also something called a, a unique ancestors coefficient. Um, there was an Australian study sh that sh showed that a smaller number of unique ancestors, when you took the pedigree right back, we do it at 10 generations because at 10 generations, the pedigrees are somewhat reliable. You get back too far, um, there's some disputes, you know, Ben Lawrence and Simon and things like that actually didn't have the pedigrees they're supposed to have. But if you do a 10 generation unique ancestor coefficient, the grade one winners come from a much smaller band on those metrics than do the grade two winners, the grade three winners and the horses that were not distinguished. Um, and so there's a measurable metric. We did a study on 12,000 yearlings that were foals of 2015, I think, commercial yearlings. And, and so there are some metrics you can actually have now on that. And I say she's unusual because she's that closely inbred, but her overall scores go back more towards what you'd expect with a grade one winner because the rest of the pedigree is now cross. And Fiona, when you, when you talk about being inbred, just because I'm conscious there's people on the line oh, you know, she has the a same. passing interest in racing. Yeah. What, what, what does that mean? What's the kind of, she, what does that get to? She, she is a, a granddaughter of Galileo who was by saddle as well. So on her father's side, in the third quadrant of the pedigree, she has a horse called saddle as well. So he was a champion sire, champion racehorse. In turn, her mother is by saddle as well. So that's the slightly unusual aspect of it, that she has what we call Saddler's Wells on top, paternal side, and Saddler's Wells underneath. Now, that has not been a pattern that's been particularly successful. And as you can probably imagine, there are masses of people with Saddler's Wells now, mares, now sending them to inbreed to Saddler's Wells. It has not, this is probably, this could well be a one-off. It's not a particularly successful pattern. It will be repeated. But whether it, it's repeated to enable another enable is questionable, I'd say. Yeah, I, I very much agree with Fiona there. Mm. You, you can pick on a horse like that who's the unicorn, maybe, yeah. and yeah. go up a blind alley. I, I agree completely. It's, yeah. you, you don't try and... There's a lot of matings that might work, but you're mm. trying to do... Fiona and I are trying to do the mating that's most likely to work. And, and yes, mm. you, you wouldn't copy this. Um, yeah. I agree. Uh, we've had some great suggestions in terms of what should breed breeder to Michael Finch, Keno Sullivan, Vicky Gibbons, they all said Kingman, Debawi, Peter Stanley and Jane Mang Mangan picked out, Invincible Spirit, I saw Connor Norris had a great submission on. Uh, when, when you're looking at a filly with, like Enable, so talented, the best race mare out there, and she's inbred in the way she, that she is, where do you go in terms of a stallion? Are you immediately thinking an outcross? Or, or indeed, would you, would you think of like, something a bit more different are you do or do you want just a really particular a big outcross for a mare like this what where, where do you go to alan i would probably want to stay away from uh saddler's wells for example i mean i, I did see one of our um, entries had her down to frankel and i mean that historically is a degree of inbreeding that's tended not to be successful so i i would tend to look at something that's done well cross well with saddler's wells cross well with galileo um perhaps pick up some other strains in the pedigree because you know they've probably got an affinity with Saddler's Wells, but I'd be staying well clear of Saddler's Wells. P perhaps the nearest thing I would bring in is um, saying Nuriev, who's Saddler's Wells relative. Mm -hmm. And we have, a, we have a question here. Marie, I'm just going to go live to you so you can, get, you can answer via audio if that's okay. And she has a question about the most efficient way to inbreed. So I'm just going to let you answer live here. Can you hear oh, us, Marie? That's for Fiona, if that's okay. Okay, sure. Can't hear it, Jack. Yeah, she'll, uh, she'll come online, I'd say. I might have just caught her <laughs> unawares, that's all. The question is, Fiona, and uh, yeah. Marie, I've taken a little bit of time to get organized, but she said, what is the most efficient way to inbreed? Would you be reluctant to use a mating that is inbreeding? So in contrast to what Alan is saying, like, is there a, an efficient way to do it? Is there something that you, sometimes Moy Glare would go about and say, do you know what, yeah. we might try that. Is it something like a dam sire? Would you ever look at a, you know, inbreeding? Yeah. I, I mean, I think you research like it. You research it. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the statistics you can find about inbreeding. You look if, it's, if that's a combination of two horses you even want to have in the pedigree. Does it suit the mare? Does it suit what you're trying to do with her? You know, we're, we're, our pedigrees are so dominated in Europe now by the Northern Dancer, particularly um, Saddler's Wells and Dane Hill, 
that often it's becoming a real problem at times to avoid inbreeding. Personally, I prefer to push it further back if I possibly can. But I would also look at inbreeding to very good mares. That for me, I'm keener on doing than just stallion stallion. If I can, so I'll push it back into the distant generations. So when you talk about those very good mares, what would be the ones that would jump out to you? What would be the ones? Like for example, kind of I'd be very intrigued by, and I think I've actually done it this year, a See the Stars or Galil on a Galileo mare, or the reverse it mm -hmm. round, mm -hmm. because they share the same female family, and that was an incredibly prepotent mare. Now, I don't want to have it there in the first generation, but I think that's something that will come up going through the generations. So and, yeah, uh, I'd be inclined to try and do something like that more than just Galileo on top of Galileo. That wouldn't appeal to me. I think you slow the pedigree down. And uh, Paul, um, Alan, I suppose this, the, the question here from Paul Hennessy was inbreeding, when we think about it as humans, we think about it, you know, in terms of issues, you know, as a result of that. Can inbreeding sometimes uh, result in physical deformities? Um, yeah, there's a thing called inbreeding depression um, mm. that, that happens in a breed as, as a, as a mm. whole. Now, mm. with the thoroughbred, basically what's happened is it's always been, uh, you know, we, we, we've tested and discarded a, a lot of issues um so a, a lot of issues that would come up with inbreeding have been got rid of they've been sort of i mean one of the, one of the things if, if you inbreed and you cull you can more or less temper a breed and almost in a sense purify of some some bad aspects um but as fiona said in, inbreeding is contextual it's neither good nor bad i mean there was a filly called Coronation V just after the mm. Second World War yeah. who won the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. Mm -hmm. She was by a son of Torbjorn out of a Torbjorn yeah. mare. On the other out. hand, you can, look, you can look at Secretariat who mm. was as outcrossed as a good horse yeah. could be. Mm. You, you can get good horses. People get hung up on, I think, rigid formulas. And, you know, sometimes you'll do a pedigree where you will inbreed fairly closely. I think I've had you know, good winners that might be two by three to a stallion or something like that, or, 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 or two by three to a mare. Mm -hmm. And as Fiona said, I think there are reasons why mare inbreeding works, which we might come round to in, 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 uh, in respect of enabled eventually, but mm -hmm. there's no hard and fast rules. Um, mm -hmm. Generally too close an inbreeding doesn't work. Um, once you get past a certain point, you know, I, I, I use true and I'll declare an interest here. I was partly involved and in, in, in owned part of Trunix, but on, on top of the nicking statistics, we're including now these coefficients of inbreeding. And we know that once you get past a certain degree of inbreeding, historically your chances of having a good horse de decrease. Doesn't say you can't, I mean, enable as an example, you can do that. But probably if I had a farm that had 30 high class mares, I probably wouldn't do a mating as closely as enable. So I, I would probably never have done enables mating. Now you're going to do enables mating because we need to figure <laughs> out what we might breed this wonderful mare to. Fiona, if you were sitting down at your desk and Judmont rang you in a panic and said, Fiona, we've sold enable, it's gone to Mr. Multitech. We need a breeding and, and what, would, what would come to your mind straight away? What stallions would you be thinking about? Well, I'm hideously conservative. You know me, Jack, I, I would never breed a mare like this to an unproven horse. Um, she's got the brilliance and she's got the class and she's got the acceleration, even though she stays a mile and a half. I don't really want to mess with Enable. So we're all going to know a lot more about Enable when we stand there and look at her first foal. And until we see her first foal, and that's an enormous issue with this. And this is where Judmont have an advantage because they've seen... They've seen all the half-sisters, the half-brothers, everything else in the family. They have an idea in their mind what this mare is producing. And also, I would probably go, I'm torn between Kingman and Dubai, I probably would go Kingman. And Dubai, okay. sorry, not Dubai. That, I'd probably go Kingman. Alan, what would you think if, if Judman knocked on, Judman knocked, or Mr. Multitech, I, in fact? I'm going to be boring because I, I, I very much concur with a lot of what Fiona's saying. And I, and I guess that's in part because we've both done this for a long, long time and, mm. and, and you learn the hard lessons of experience. Um, 
and you know there might be a temptation to, to try and be a genius and do something unorthodox but the best the best way is with a, a proven high class horse i probably i think kingman might be the better mating but i would do dubawi this year purely mm, because of his yeah. age um yeah the, the, yeah the argument for that is look I mean, yesterday we had a great one when you hear CC that was conceived when the losing quality was 22. Mm. But there is a trend, even for yeah. the best stallions, even when they're getting be you know, still yeah. getting very, very good mares to tail yeah. off. So mm. if I was ever going to do Dubai, I'd, I'd do it sooner than later. And I mean, in terms of why, um, he's been a very, you know, it, it, it's, it's conservative uh, things. It, he's been a very good cross for Galileo. Mm. Um, an interesting thing is that we've started looking at mitochondrial haplotypes, that the, looking at the female line in a slightly different way. Um, the, there, there's a genetic material called mitochondria that travel only up the female line from mare to mare. They're outside of the nucleus of the cell and they're to do with energy production. Uh, and it's been found that nuclear DNA, particularly related to how energy is produced through fat and glycogen. Um, you have to have the, the correct nuclear DNA for the mitochondrial DNA for optim, optimal um, efficiency. And enable is a haplotype, um, a branch of what's called the I haplotype. Um, you know, using those old Bruce Lowe numbers, it's generally the number four and 13 families as, as in as much as they're reliable. Um, and, and when you look at Dubawi, He's done incredibly well with those um, families. Now it's it's a common female line, but if you if you happen to look at the those female lines, he seems to love that. Now, you know, we don't know statistically how much that plays. You know, it's not like Dubai we can't get a good winner out of another haplotype mare. You know, maybe it's a ten percent advantage, maybe it's fifteen. It it maybe it's not consistent across every stallion, but Dubai we. Um, does well with the female line so so everything says that he's very suitable here i mean with kingman you've got the evidence on the page of a good kingman from the exact family so they both be excellent matings just purely on um purely on dubawa's age i'd say now or never and go with him first year okay well let's see if the jack jack yes fiona, fiona another fiona, comment yes. with a mare like an able particularly for an owner breeder is Another reason to try and, I wouldn't say outcross her, is you've always got to keep in mind, if she has a filly, what are you going to breed that to? Mm. And that's another reason not to, you know, because if you, say, for example, went bananas and decided to add more saddle as wells in there, you've got to have an idea when you're breeding a mare like that. I know you're way advanced, but in four years' time, you could be having to breed her daughter. And I think that's something to keep in the back of your mind. What, what would suit the best? Do you put all that Northern Dancer into a pedigree? I mean, Kingman is in Green Desert on top of Mr. Prospector. Obviously, Dubawi is Mr. Prospector on top of Shirley Heights. Which is going to give you the most room down the road? Because obviously, if a naval has a filly, I'm going to hazard a guess that Judd Mon will be breeding from it. <laughs> Okay. Good, yes, good, point. good point. Well, that's, it's quite unfortunate for Judmont that we've bought an able. <laughs> and, and, and now we need to do our poll. So we're going to have a live poll, and I want everyone that's online to participate in this. So I am going to launch our poll. These are our 10 stallions, which were from our homework, the most suggested matings. And uh, let's see what our uh, uh, class think. Here we go. So it's going to be live voting. Um, so what do people think? You can vote there. I've allowed the panel to vote. Oh, Sayuni made a little jump. Dubawi, Kingman. Oh, no name ever gets his first vote. Okay, we, I, think we, I think they agree. I think Dubawi is leading, but Kingman has also done very well with 27 votes. We'll give it another 10 seconds. Get your votes in. So there we have it. Sheikh Mohammed is going to be very proud. <laughs> queen, the queen of the turf is on her way to Dubawi. So well done, everyone. Uh, Dubawi uh, is our number one mating, followed by Kingman, followed by Sea the Stars. Right, great. Our next mayor. 
the American champion. Fiona, something we didn't talk about with uh, Enable, and it's very important. When you, when you think about matings and you think about the physical of a horse, what, what comes to mind? What were you trying to do? What, what types of attributes are you thinking about when you're trying to match the physical of the stallion with the physical of the mare? How does that work in, in, in Moy Gerstud? Um, looking at the size, the shape, the quality, um, the amount of bone, the strength in the limbs, the size of the feet, um, the overall strength of the mare. You know, do you have a short, but short barreled mare with great depth or do you have a long angular mare? They all breed good horses. It just, it changes a little bit what you breed them to. And also their aptitude. What do they do? What surface do they run on? You know, do they run on dirt? Do they run on turf? Do they run short? Do they run long? Are they typical of their pedigree? Are they, have they come from the moon? Do they look like the stallion? All of those factors. There's so many different factors that go into it. It's a in, very inexact science. But if you're boiling those factors down to a simple question, which is, do you breed a type to a type or do you breed a type to something it lacks? What, where do you land on that? Where, I think what, you, what try you try and reinforce, I, try, I think you try and reinforce the mare's strengths. And I think you try, don't dilute what makes her good. I think yeah. you, re, you reinforce the strengths and you don't try and be too clever. If you've got a mare that's absolutely brilliant in one sphere, don't mess with it too much. You know, if she's brilliant and she's that brilliant, which Midnight Bisu is, who am I to say that she should be a different shape? So I would compliment her shape, but I would certainly wouldn't breed away from it. Alan, what would you, how would you reflect on Fiona's comments yeah. there? No, no, I, I, th I think again, you know, practical experience has probably taught us a lot of the same things. You, you do not want to get radically different types together because you, you don't, genetically, you don't get a mix of the two. You get, might get yeah. the front end of the one, Mm. and the back end of the other you know it, mm. it, it's it's like the female long distance runner or ballerina with a shot putter you know you don't want the shot putter's body on the ballerina's legs and, and it's also unlikely if, if you've got a mare that's very good at doing one thing that you breed her to a stallion that's a contrast you're going to get not only biomechanical contrast you're going to get contrast of, of attributes you know that there are things that are Genetically and things like cardio, they're, they're not necessarily good or bad in isolation, but the cardio that a sprinting filly has would be very different than a mile and a half cold. You know, so you, you don't want, you, you want to try and maybe slightly adjust. So if you had a mare that's, a, you know, an out and out galloping stay or say mile and a half, mile and three quarter type, you might want to breed her to a mile and a quarter type horse rather than another out and out galloping stayer, unless, unless you wanted a real galloping stayer. You might make minor adjustments, but you don't do big con contradictions. And Fiona, when you're thinking about physical deformities, so you have a you have a filly, and, and unfortunately she's offset, and you, I, she then make a very deliberate action of breeding to a very correct stallion. Um, well, or what, what do you think about when when they lack something? Well, I think when you've got a mare that's performed as well as she has and as consistently as she has, okay, she didn't win as a two-year-old, but she, she ran a very, she was only beaten the nose and she's gone through and she hasn't taken a bad step. I think you can get too hung up on that. Obviously, if she has an offset knee on the right, then you probably would lean away from breeding to a stallion that has an offset knee on the right. But at the same time, She's obviously stayed sound. She's obviously managed it. Now that's where the sales and the breeding to race come in a slight difference. And yeah. you know that because we're always debating it. Um, mm -hmm. If you're going to sell the foal, it has to be perfect. Because people will knock it for having a deformity. If you're going to race it, again, I get back to the same point. She's coped with absolutely everything. Yes, you, you always aim to get a sound, clean athlete. But it doesn't always happen like that. Mm -hmm. And now to turn to our pedigree. So we look at our page. What jumps out about this pedigree, Alan? Well, the Dam was a very good runner for a period in the, I think, late two-year-old, particularly through the spring of a three-year-old career. It is not a particularly strong page. I mean, it, it's, she, she wouldn't have been a book one September sales or you know, a premier sales horse immediately on, on page. Midnight Loot was a very talented horse. I don't think it's any secret that he had several wind operations. He raced as a sprinter, 
um, but had a pedigree to get further. He's been a useful um, but not outstanding stallion. What I see in the pedigree in terms of it producing a good runner is probably the strength is the background of um, Northern Dancer and Bow Ruler combinations in there. I think you've got that through Midnight Loops, Broodmare, Sire de Hair. You've got it through the male line of um, The Dam, um, Repent by Louis Couture's by Sovereign Dancer, who was bred that way. And then at the bottom of the pedigree, you've got Medagli Doro, who was a secretary out of Fanfalouche, who was one of Northern Dancer's best daughters. So it's probably a mating where Fiona was talking about getting inbreeding and line breeding back away from being too close up, where you've got several combinations of things that work together and they're a little bit back off the page you know it, it's 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 sort of the opposite of the um of, of the mating we saw with enable where there's close inbreeding she's more of an outcross but she's got a number of similar crosses further back in the pedigree um the female line had not produced much of real quality mu nothing much better than the dam who was a grade three winner uh in recent years so it's it, it it was it it's a pedigree that kind of came a little bit out of the blue. And Fiona, was there any of the uh, homework that was submitted that kind of jumped out at you that made you kind of think again of what you were thinking in terms of amazing? No, I, you know, I, I mean, basically it was circling around good American dirt horses. This is not a mare to go to a European turf horse. She is a top class seven to a, a mile and an eighth um, dirt horse. I, you know, to breed her to a turf horse would just be bananas. You're, you, you know, you, there's no point doing that. You dilute what she's so good at. She's, she's, she's teaching herself to stay a bit further. But I mean, she's really, really, really good. There's a distance in America, a mile and a sixteenth. And even mm. though for us in Europe, the difference between eight and a half furlongs and nine furlongs is not a great deal. In the United States, it's a great deal. She's, she, uh, it's, it's a very long way. She's extremely good at a mile and a sixteenth. And I think, therefore, you know, she, it's a Florida pedigree. All the influencers are there, which produces good, hard-knocking racehorses. She has just jumped out of this pedigree. Now, whether it's midnight loot, what it is, we'll never know. But I just think she just needs to go. It's Florida, it's dirt, it's fast. She needs to go back to something that's going to complement all of that. Just don't mess with it, you know? So the and ones Alan, I liked, Curlin is the one that stands out to me because I think he'd suit her physically. And I think you also, you get a double of deputy minister in there, which is very appealing. And if anything, Midnight Loot works with anything, it's adding in more deputy minister. She also that, slightly, you know, the suggestions of Tappet and Warfront, they have, she has a, quite a fair bit of tartan breeding in her background, which is very typical of Florida breeding. Tappet has that, so does War, Warfront through the Rubiano. So she's, she's not a difficult mare to mate. It's just that without having her in front of you, when you can critique, if she's a typical midnight loot, she's probably quite tall, quite leggy, probably needs a bit of bone, but very athletic and very quality. And that's what I, I haven't seen her close up. But from the pictures I've seen, that's what she looks like to me. And Alan, when, a, lot of, a lot of the homework they kind of talked about justify... I know American Pharaoh has had runners of merit, but when we talk about these un unproven stallions that are very exciting in the American market, would you ever take a chance? Is there ever a moment where you t you consider something like that? Um, would you? I, would you consider? F funny enough, I did a mating for the dam with Justify. We, we bought Diva Delight when Midnight Bizu was a three-year-old. Um, she was carrying a Pioneer of the Nile. We bred the dam to Justify um, because, again, picking up this you know some of this Stormcat, this Northern Dancer uh, secretary background. And he's got some of the same things as the Fabiano strains in there. Um, and it was, a, it was a commercial play because the dam was a proven producer. And then we actually put her back in the sales with Midnight Bees who had this tremendous four-year-old career because she was on a later service. But I would want to go if I could with a proven stallion. Okay. Um, and, and again, as, as Fiona said, it, it almost seems like in America, because the races are run almost like a human 800 meter race. They, they start fast and they get slower and slower and slower on dirt. And, and you've got a whole different set of physical and um, physical and, and attributes and, all, you know, and also um, the way the oxygen transport thing works and things like that, oxygen debt tolerance. 
because it's basically starting fast and hanging on, probably because it's harder to accelerate on dirt. So the whole physiology can be different. Um, and you get these momentum horses. So again, he would, wouldn't, suit tur wouldn't suit turf. Curlin's interesting because he is a, um, he's a Mr. Prospector, Deputy Minister Cross, and he got Vino Rosso out of a mare bred like that. So uh, Fiona's choice, Curlin's interesting. Um, I liked Into Mischief also. Um, he's done quite well with mares, Fapiano influence. He brings in the, the storm cat. She, she's a mare that seems to me to be open to quite a few choices where you, you, there's, there's nothing to say you can't do that. She's less obvious where something is really jumping at saying you really should do that. Um, Into Mischief is going to give you a little bit more speed. A curling's probably going to go a mile and a quarter without too much trouble out of a mare. Um, you're going to get past that, as I say, physiological barrier. As, as Fiona said, it seems strange, but physiologically, eight and a half is probably a different thing than nine and ten for a mature horse in America. Um, probably if you're a three-year-old, you can get away through the, uh, through the spring. You can be a three-year-old sprinter miler and win good races at a mile and eighth and even maybe a Kentucky Derby. As you mature, that kind of horse needs to almost come back in distance. Mm -hmm. So you'll see horses win, say, a Santa Anita Derby, a mile and an eighth, maybe fail in the Derby, and then they'll drop back and be good sprinter milers. Um, but she, she's a mare that at one point was definitely much better at eight and a half than nine, but she seems to have, um, e either through quality or maturity or riding style, seems, seems to have made that leap. So she, she wouldn't be a mare that would, you know, nothing would stop you breeding a 10 for a long horse out of her. So... I say I, I liked Into Mischief. He was he was my first pick. Um, Curlin's an interesting idea too. Uh, so Fiona, we've uh, you suggested Curlin. Alan is going for Into Mischief, but I suppose a client is an owner breeder, and as an owner breeder, is usually mm. they race the fillies and sell the colts. Mm. In Moy Glare, do you ever uh, mate a horse thinking about broodmare sires, proven broodmare sires that perhaps are not? you know, the May West in terms of just producing runners in general, good colts, but they are brilliant broodmare sires. Like I'm thinking of a Bernardini in the United yeah. States, you know, a yeah. brilliant broodmare sire, but perhaps, you know, not a, with the opportunities had, hasn't had the success generally in the market. Mm. You know, Pivotal is a wonderful sire, but he's also a wonderful broodmare sire. Do you, do, mm. do you think about broodmare sires sometimes as an owner and breeder, where you perhaps wouldn't think about it in a more general sense when making a mate? I do, I do, but not on a mare like this. And you're pretty yeah. much guaranteed if I breed to a stallion to get a filly, it'll come out as a colt. <laughs> so, if I send, so, you know, as a rule, a mare like this, probably not. An older mare, definitely, when you're looking for a filly. But just sod's law, sorry, sorry. I would get a colt. And therefore, mm -hmm. you know, you, you don't go, you know, what you want is a filly out of a... But out of a mare of this age, of this type, I think, obviously, you know, if, she, if he wants to sell a colt out of her, then you go for what is the jazzy sales horse at the moment. When I like Into Mischief on her, and I agree with you, I just, my only question was though, if she is a typical midnight loot and quite tall and scopy, I just wondered whether you're in danger of getting something a bit leggy. That was why I came down on the side of curling. Yeah. And tap it was mentioned. That's the only, and it's Quality Road is the same thing. I just was a bit worried because I'm going to guess that she's quite up in the air. I was just a little bit worried that we get something leggy, but without seeing her in front of us both, it's very hard to judge. Okay, well, we've had two suggestions there from our experts, but of course, much more important are mm. our class. So let's see, we'll launch our next poll. There we are, what do we think? What are we gonna breed America's best mare to? So Tappet, an initial leader there. America yeah, yeah, Pharaoh yeah. doing very well. Galileo hasn't had a single vote, so they've listened to you about um, the difference between a dirt mare and a turf mare. Mm -hmm. Curlin doing very well. Okay, we'll give it another 10 seconds. Okay, so here are the results. So you can mm. see that American Pharaoh with 15% of the vote. Into Mischief, a bit of disagreement there with the experts, only 12%. <laughs> Tappet, 22%. Yeah. But our winner um, is Curlin, uh, 26%. Mm. Um, so uh, Mr. Multitech, we have another mating for you. Right, our next mayor.
<laughs> something a bit different. Yeah, something very Deirdre. different. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so Fiona, when you were sent this mating, what, <laughs> what jumped out straight away? Oh boy, Japanese. Um, um, she, she, she's actually a very interesting mare. I was at Leperstown when she, um, I was at Leperstown when she ran in the champion stakes, where I probably got myself into trouble here. I didn't think she got the best of rides. Going through a race record, she's an interesting mare because she's obviously got an awful lot of talent. But whether it's a lack of acceleration or how she runs a race herself, or maybe just the ride she gets, she just, she's not consistent. She just seems to miss the big round circle a lot of the time. And I just, and I don't know whether, I don't know whether that's her, that people expect her to whiz by at the finish, which some people do. I just thought the last, some of her races, I thought in Dubai as well, I just was a bit surprised that she didn't finish stronger than she did. Um, it's uh, obviously Harbinger, I remember him. Um, obviously you've got Sunday Silence in the pedigree here. Um, he is, he was probably the preeminent stallion in Japan for a long time. Um, he's obviously worked very well with her pedigree. I do remember Sonic Lady, I'm that old. Um, it's a nice pedigree, Japanese for the last two generations. She is obviously bred. Her dam was bred on very similar lines to the other relations in the pedigree. Um, but Harbinger and Special Week, there's not a lot there to go on at the moment. And Alan, buying a filly by Harbinger, what would excite you from a mating perspective there? I mean, not so much that she's a Harbinger. I mean, you'd be excited because she's a high-level filly. Um, I mean, Harbinger actually is doing very, very well in Japan. Um, she looks actually, her pedigree suggests she'd run further than mm, she's been yeah. raced. I mean, she's, she's mostly been raced as a sort of, mm. you know, nine, nine, ten furlong yeah. horse. And she kind of charges on from, stays on from the back, I guess, a couple of races I watched. Um, I mean, you've got to get a little that, imaginative. Sorry? With the fact he's by Dan Silly, would that be something that would, uh, you, would, well, would Dan form your Well, Dan is a very good broodmare, sir. I mean... One of the things that's hard with her, you know, you might want to do Galileo Dane Hill, but outside of Galileo himself, you know, you don't have many stallions that are Galileo that are Dane Hill free. And that Dane Hill, Dane Hill two by, sorry, Dane Hill yeah. three by three in the center of the pedigree for those horses hasn't tended to be great. No. Um, whether it would be better with that a little further back, I don't know. I mean, she is, she, she's a more challenging mare um, because there, there are, there's, there's less sort of granularity. You know, there's, there's less, if you're climbing a rock face, you can't get your fingers in there quite so much. Um, you've got to be a bit more creative here, you know, with her, a little more imaginative. You, there, there's some reasons you can't do some of the things that have worked over Dan Silly. Um, she's always sort of painting yourself into a corner mare a little bit, or she's painted into a corner. So I'd encourage any questions people have and to submit on our Q&A button um, at below. But I suppose, Fiona, when you, is this some, a mating that you, you think, well, why don't we just stick to the best stallion there is in Japan and go to Lord Canola? Or what would you well, be thinking about in Europe? Where, where would you kind of go I learned something. Yeah, I learned something about Lord Canola because I actually went through that because I said, well, King Canola. Um, all, all, all Lord Can sure. Canola. I mean, actually... With the success that that sire line has had with um, Sunday Silence, and I'd have absolutely no idea what any of them were. King, Ke what was his name? Kami Hamea. King Kami yeah. Hamea. That's it, right? Okay. Wow, that's so, impressive, Alan. There you go. I'm very impressed. I, I knew it was here somewhere. I just couldn't see how to pronounce it. I, I did the meeting for him. That's on. Oh, okay. That's well, <laughs> he's, you know, I, I mean, she being Sonic Lady with the Nuri of there and the background the Sonic Lady had. By using a, a, a great grandson of King Mambo, you're bringing back in very much the same, top and bottom. Um, I, you know, the Dan Silly is yes there. I've gone round and round actually on breeding a Dan Silly mare to Frankel, and I, 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 I haven't done it. Round and round and round and round. Carla Bianca was the mare, and I haven't done it because for me it's too close. With Harbinger, Dan Silly is a further generation away, and hence I'd wondered about Frankel, but you are doubling. Dane Hill right there and so hence I actually the Japanese option quite appealed to me 
Um, if it was Northern Farm, that's probably exactly what they do, but it's Mr. Multitech. So I don't know, is he inclined to breed in Japan or not? Well, it's our suggestion and we, the world is our oyster. Alan, okay. where would you suggest we, we turn to? Uh, actually, pr pragmatically, this is, and this is just an illustration of some of the things we, we also think about. She's a, she's a maiden. If she's, in, if she's not in Japan right now, she's a maiden. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to send her to Japan, you might do it this time rather than when she's got a foal. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Unless you're going to leave her out there for two seasons. And, and that would be an interesting option. Um, I was assuming I couldn't have a second Dubawi. I oh, thought about yeah. um, Nathaniel um, a little bit as being a Galileo that was free of Danehill. And he's, he's worked over Danehill. Um, so that would be another way of going. Okay. And, and I suppose, Fiona, when you... Uh, so you think about Deirdre, Deirdre and you think about the uh, a black type and it's Japanese black mm. type. I think something mm. some people think about a lot is the merit of different types of black type. Mm. You know, I, I, from my perspective, I would always rank Japanese black type actually is very difficult to get. So if I, yeah, if I see, if, yeah, if I see a horse with that Yeah, yeah and she, she won, won a little, an asshole as well. Uh, she won an asshole. I'm just looking at her yeah, black yeah. pedigree. But I suppose you know, when, she... you rank, when you rank jurisdictions in terms of ease of getting black type, like what jurisdictions immediately jump to mind is that's a difficult place for it to, to develop a family tree with the back pedigree that Deirdre has. No black type is easy. Yeah. <laughs> I, wish I, I wish it was, but no yeah. black yeah. type is easy. It, it, you know, it, it's the days when you got easy stakes winnings. I, you know, yeah. I, wherever you are, that is, that is the one hard. To win a stakes race is the ultimate, you know? And for many people, they never win a stakes race. To breed the winner of a stakes race is the ultimate. You know, and then you go up to group one, group two, whatever. But just to breed a stakes winner that can beat all the horses, that is a real challenge. And, you know, this mare, I would, again, I, having seen her, I, that's, I think she needs acceleration. I think she needs speed. I think she needs, and as I said, it may be the way she was ridden. I just think of all the ones we're talking about, she needs a bit of an injection. Now, whether that comes through King Canola or his father, I don't know. But I think that's what she needs. Could, could you do a Lope de Vega? I think she's a bit plain for him, isn't she? Yeah, that's the problem, yeah. Yeah, they said, she's quite damn silly, I thought. I thought she was quite yeah. damn silly in her head and her shape. Angular, tails off a bit behind. I gather she's got the most wonderful temperament. So, I mean, she could possibly be another candidate for Kingman, but I think you're breeding very much like to like there. I, you know, Frankel has appeal to me, as long as you can get your head around the double of Dane Hill. Uh, Sean had a suggestion um, of Sayuni. That, that would give you a bit of pace. What would you think of that, Fiona? Same Dane Hill situation. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and yeah. historically, he's been... Now, this is where... I mean, this is where these days we have an advantage over people say, even fit, I mean, even, well, even when I started working in the industry, um, we, we've got a lot of statistics and, and it doesn't take a second to look at um, Sayuni when he's crossed back with, with Danzig. It, it's it's mm. not been good historically. No. He's got the one very Double good Doubling Hill. Mm. Yes, particularly Dane Hill. I mean, mm. I, I'm like Fiona, I, I'm like agonizing with Frankel because we're starting to see, I'm thinking like, um, is it Zoo Star, um, where you've got a, a generation further back, mm. where he's out of a mare by a son of Dane Hill, and I think mm. Sebring was, and they worked mm. okay back over. The, the mm. Dane Hill three by three in the middle of the pedigree has not been good historically. No. It's getting less bad a generation further back, where we're seeing mm. stallions out of mares by sons of Dane Hill. Um, mm. Say, so I think Zoo Star is one in Australia. And I, yeah, Frankl, I would. I think at some point there'd be a point where you tried Frankel. Um, whether you did it first time or not, I don't know. Okay, I, I so agree, we, it's the same, same dilemma. So Fiona, where, are we landing on Lord Canola on your end? Or what are you thinking? Uh, or are you, are, yeah, I mean, do you want, you know, a, do you want some speed? Do you want a speed suggestion? Well, well, well yeah, but you know, you know me, I'm class rather than speed. I don't want a sprinter, no. Because I think she's got, she just needs an an injection of just, for me, acceleration. And it just may be that when I've watched her races, it's just the way the race is set up. But I just feel that she just needs, she just lacks a little bit of this. I mean, see the stars appeals to me for her. 
But again, if we get a Colt, will it have the acceleration? So that was really why I came down. I don't know enough about King, King Canola. Um, I like the pedigree mix. I like the top and bottom. I don't know enough about him. Hence, that makes me a little bit blind to judge. I, if I owned her, would I try Frankel? I go round and round in circles thinking about it. Or would I put her on a plane and go back to King Canola? Hmm. Maybe King Canola. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Alan, a question here from Brian Bunyan for you. Um, yeah. He wanted to ask, stats on top race mares, these are all top race mares, you know, 120 plus rated, that them themselves have got, gone on to produce offsprings to be 120 oh, plus, God. 110 plus. Is that something you've looked, like, looked at Hansel. in your research? I, I have not looked at that specifically. Mm. What I can tell you is that there is a definite trend of higher class mares, the more talented mares make better producers. You, know, you, you can look at even ones with unfashionable pedigrees, given that, say you're in the $400,000 region or some half a million dollar region, you're better off with a, you get probably a, a grade two winner with an unfashionable pedigree for that. You're better off with that grade two winner with the unfashionable pedigree than you are with the well-bred mare that ran twice and couldn't do anything for the same money. That there's definitely, I mean, you, you want as much of both pedigree and performance because if, if you get performance without the pedigree, you've probably got uh, more recessive influences there. Um, but, but in general, you want as much quality. And, and, and you know, people look at the good mares that didn't produce a, anything uh, but then often you'll find their daughters do, you know, if there's a generation yeah. skip. Um, yeah. if, if you look at the horse that, um, Contrail, that just won the Japanese 2000 yeah. guineas last night, who's probably a very, very, very good horse. He's out of a mare called, T um, by Tisnow, uh, he's out of a daughter of a mare, sorry, uh, by Tisnow called Folklore. She's never produced anything, but mm. she had an unbridled song daughter that's actually got quite a lot of line breeding. And she's produced this very, very good horse to deep impact. Um, so you do want, I think, as much performance as possible. You know, you might look at a mare like that and say, oh, she failed. But, you know, that, that you're talking about mares of this standard being, I mean, I think 3% of the breed win a stake, 1% win graded stakes. A, a, a Deirdre is probably the top half a percent of the breed. You know, so there's, there's not many of them and you might focus on them and say, oh, that one didn't breed, produce anything. But by and large, that there's definitely a correlation between the class of the mare as a runner and what she produces. Okay, great. Well, we, we're going to have our last poll. So I'm launching <laughs> it now. Let's see what our final mating of this evening is going to be. So I have to apologize to Alan. The, pe the good people who submitted their uh, coursework, they didn't pick Nathaniel, so he doesn't reach our top 10. Um, but we have, and we've an er a very strong early lead by a stallion we haven't talked enough about, Galileo. Um, Frankel mm -hmm. also doing very well. Um, Fiona's suggestion, Lord Canola or King Canola has done very well. He's, he's on four. We'll give it another 10 seconds and we'll have our winner. Get your votes in. End poll. So we're off to, get, we're off to Tipperary. It's Galileo <laughs> with 30% of the vote. Um, and then following up after that, we have Frankel. And then we have our, we're the land of the rising sun and King Canola or Lord Canola. Look, so that, yeah. that's our, our mating of Deirdre. And I'll share those results so you can see them for yourself. There we have it. I, I will say Lord Canola is an interesting horse because he was, I don't can't remember, he may have been top of the world rankings as a sprinter miler, mm. but he must mm. be what they call a CT sprinter miler because he's been one of those horses that you can make with middle distance and his first couple of crops, he's got middle distance runners. So he's not a dedicated sprinter that can't cross mm. well with a middle distance horse. Okay, great. Well, we're going to open it out to questions. I must thank Weatherby's for uh, very kindly providing all these pedigrees, which really bring to life the family tree that we've been exploring for our tree mares and their, their wonderful app that I know so many of you have downloaded to uh, do your research. Um, so the, your questions, a very important part of this evening. I know we've already got a lot of quite more general questions not related to our mares. And the first one is for you, Alan. Thomas Ahern asked, 
can you explain the true NIC value a bit further? Is it based on statistical information of track success or what are the metrics that go into it? Yeah, true NICs is based, and it, it's, it's purely at the moment, we're working on some other innovations, but purely at the moment, it's based on a cross of the sire and the broodmare sire. Or if we have to go back to the next generation, we've got some algorithms that go sire with mares by the sire of the broodmare sire. So we go back generations. We try and do it based on, once there's sufficient information, like 15 starters, I think it is, we, we base it on the 15 starters if it, uh, and don't go back anymore. It's based on a formula of stakes winners by the sire at, on the cross compared to stakes winners by the sire with all matings and stakes winners on the cross compared with stakes winners out of the broodmare sire and all other matings. So it's, it's sort of an opportunity related. Now, it's a useful metric, um, probably more in telling you what doesn't work you know, if, if you find that there's something been tried uh, 50 times and there's been no stakes winners, then that's probably an indication to avoid it. Um, it it's becoming a little flattened because people are trying, uh, uh, since, since a number of nicking programs have been out there for a while now, people are tending to just blindly copy nicks with moderate material. Uh, like Fiona talked about, people just doing the saddle as well, saddle as well as mating because I'm enabled. Um, so you have to be a little careful. It, 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 it's information. It's not something that should be blindly blindly followed. Now, we're working on a Trunix 2.0, um, which we've written a little bit about on the Trunix site, which would include some of these inbreeding and deeper line breeding metrics and also class metrics. I mean, probably the biggest differentiator is actually class. Um, you know, it's, it's a good stallion. If, if you go and look at your pool of grade one winners in any season, more of them would be by top class stallions out of good mares than would be by clever matings out of cheap, cheap stuff. You know, if, if you go and buy cheap horses and try and improve it by clever matings, you're starting at the, you know, you're trying to jump over this stakes winning wall from a pit at the bottom. Whereas if you start with high class stock, so we're going to start trying to include some class metrics, some inbreeding and line breeding metrics and things like that and, and use artificial intelligence to weight them. So it'll get more sophisticated, but, but it's, it's a useful tool and, and it's more useful for the data that it gives you and as much as it is for the actual rating. Um, I'm going to try now another live answer to see if we can do it. So Sam Cripps has an answer. Sam, I'm just going to send you a uh, answer live. So that should uh, set up your audio if you'd like to ask your question. Okay, I don't, don't think Sam, we might, not, we might uh, abandon our live answers, but her answer, I think Fiona, you'd be well placed to answer this question. She wanted to ask uh, of the best, um, books you'd recommend you know a lot of people have a bit of spare time at the moment they want to learn more about this subject what would you recommend in terms of um books to read or resources that you use a lot that you think would people would benefit from um engaging with over this, this uh period well i think what you can you know you can certainly read i mean a book about stallions the, the, the vehicle stallion guide but i think what is also very interesting is if you Google it. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head because I haven't done it for a while. But you can go back and you can find pedigree sites. And they, what they do give you is photographs of photographs of older stallions, you know, from 50 years ago. are a great information source and of good mares. Yeah, you, know, you look at a picture of Petit Etoile. Look at a picture of Montez Mahal. They weren't perfect, but they were absolutely brilliantly fast. And I often do that because I find... You know, it's, everyone's got this image of this perfect horse. Well, you can breed a perfect horse. You can have a wonderful athlete, gorgeous shape, and then it doesn't want to run. Mm -hmm. or, it doesn't, or it doesn't want to go through with it. You know, the thoroughbred is, is bred to race, but it's like humans. They don't all want to do it. And occasionally, they want to do it their way and not the way you want it. Thinking of Search for a Song. You know, so it, it's, you know... I, Yes, there are resources, Google and whatever else, thoroughbred pedigrees. I used to read books. Do I have any to hand now? No, I just go to Google. Okay, great. Well, we've only got four minutes left. So two okay. 
final questions. Um, I think we might ask what I suppose I not, not I won't. It's, but your opinion, Kino Sullivan asked about Crystal Ocean. You know, we talked about Enable earlier mm. becoming a national hunt stallion. Yeah. Is that something that saddens you, or how do it you does, feel about yes. something like that? No, it does because I mean I grew up with those. You know, I, I think the fact now that a top class middle distance horse is not being viewed as a stallion. I mean, a top class middle horse, middle distance horse, are what Galileo was. It's what Saddler's Wells was. It's what Nathaniel was. You know, if, if those horses don't get chances at stud then not only do we, if you just breed to a sprinter, then normally speed. Is the class level the same? I think, we, I think we diminish what we're going to produce. And yes, Crystal Ocean going straight to be a National Hunt star is a shame. But that's a product I'm sure, of, I'm sure National Hunt breeders are delighted, as I know, because yeah, a lot of people you know, that have yeah, are, are, are formed an ordinary queue to use them. Yeah, uh, but that's a product so. of the commerciality. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And everybody and, thinks they yeah. should be breeding a fast horse to sell it. And the problem yeah. is, the fast horse is often gone over quite quickly. And, and, and Alan, a question for you has been like, what has been the biggest breakthrough in recent years in terms of um, developments in matings and breeding? Oh. The, the, the question has asked, has suggested perhaps it's the speed gene that, that you, could, mm. you, you could genetically uh, track the, uh, the horse. What, what, what has been something that's jumped out at you in recent times? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the developments in, in genetics, and again, of the clearing interest, because I'm involved with a company called Performance Genetics that, that Byron Rogers runs, it, it, it's the, you know the speed gene is a, is a, is a, that's a huge oversimplification. It was an interesting first step, but you can get particularly in America. There's there's a lot of CC horses that go win a Kentucky Derby or run very well in those those classic races early in their free roll career. But I mean, what we, what we're doing now, and, and we we can do it on a mare before we buy her, or we can do it on a mare at the sales. We're looking at scanning cardios. We're looking at um by you know videoing the biomechanics and getting ratings and looking at a genetic panel i think what it's told me is is more than anything it's it's more humbling in, in as much as it's telling you the, the complexity and, and how many different ways there are for a horse to be good uh, and how much you know how, how much i've maybe got lucky and got the right thing for the wrong reason at times um you know, that, that you can have a horse uh, that, that's relatively only average on cardio and biomechanics, but he's got some genes for metabolic processes and he becomes world class. You know, I think of one particular horse that, that's gone off to stud in the last couple of years. So it, it's far more multifactorial um, than we've realized. And, and it, it takes a lot of getting your head around it. But I mean, I still think basically doing the doing the research, it'll sometimes lead you to doing the right thing for reasons you, you, know, you don't know. I can, I can look back at a mating and say, well, I did a lot of research, I saw that work. Now I know perhaps why that worked, but I didn't know before. You know, I, I think a lot of these successes in inbreeding to females are to do with mitochondrial haplotypes. It, it, it's because it comes through, you know, eventually the females come through a horse bred the same way and it's a good stallion and then eventually gets back to the female line, you've bred the right nuclear DNA to the mitochondria DNA, for instance. Well, the knowledge about the interaction between the mitochondria and the nuclear DNA, that knowledge has only been available about two and a half years. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's changing fast. And, and of course, this week, we, I suppose we, we just to end on a more somber note, we, we lost Shamardal, a great elite mm -hmm. stallion that I know um, yeah. so many breeders have had success with. Uh, Fiona, Shamardal, your kind of reflections on losing him. Was he a kind of stallion you would have had in mind for mares like the, the three we've made him today? Um, I didn't have a great strike rate with, with Shamardal. I tended to breed a few hunters by him. <laughs> so possibly, yes. But um, no, I just, I, I just, I obviously couldn't figure it. And I'll just add something to Alan said, and I think it's very important here is, what people have to remember is, we have not made the thoroughbred better in the last hundred years. People were doing this long ago, before computers were invented, and they did it by researching their pedigrees and knowing their pedigrees. The thoroughbred hasn't got sounder and hasn't got faster in all that time. So just remember that. 
so the quest goes on and with that yeah. I want to thank you both very much for mm -hmm. joining us I know so many participants we had so many questions so much interaction um, it was a shame we couldn't get through it all of it but we only had an hour we've had some terrific pieces of homework um, so thank you very much for that we will go through that and we'll pick out um, the best one the best piece of homework after hearing from the experts today but I want to thank everyone for joining hopefully you've jo enjoyed it if you have any feedback please message me on Twitter um, but most importantly, thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Alan. And uh, I Thanks, hope Jack. everyone enjoyed. Thank, thank you. Great. Yes. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.